Um, I am now going to transition uh, to our next session. We are really pleased to welcome Superintendent Catherine Truitt to our stage. Uh, she's gonna share some thoughts on the future of the teaching profession in our state. As North Carolina State Superintendent, Catherine Truitt's work focus is focused on improving the state's public schools, expanding innovation, and creating new opportunities for students to learn, grow, and successfully transition into the post-secondary plans of their choice. Superintendent Truitt's service in education began as a high school English teacher, where she spent 10 years in the classroom. In 2025, excuse me, in 2015, Superintendent Truett was given the opportunity to apply her experience as a teacher and a coach to help shape education policy in North Carolina as Governor Pat McCrory's senior education advisor. Prior to her election as state superintendent in 2020, she served as chancellor of nonprofit Western Governors University of North Carolina. Superintendent Truett. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and be a part of this year's Best in C Innovation Lab. I'm incredibly honored to be here with you for just a little bit to talk about something that I feel very passionate about. And I have a feeling you all do too, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, when we think about the problems or the challenges that we need to solve for in education, we certainly need to think about the foundation of our public education system, which is its teachers. And when we can all agree that that foundation is at risk, we have to ask ourselves, how can we solve this problem? And whenever you're solving a problem, you're, you have to start by asking, well, is the system that we're working within part of the problem? Is the system part of the problem? Now, there's lots of different opinions about how, what needs to be fixed, how it needs to be fixed in public education, but I wanna submit to you four assumptions that I think we can all agree on when it comes to public education. The first one <clears throat> is this, that the system we have is built on the idea that kids move through the system in kindergarten through 12th grade, their progress is measured essentially the same way using a very narrow set of outcomes. Now this doesn't mean that this is how all teachers approach their job, but certainly this is what the system asks of them. Assumption number two, Educator prep programs must teach to teachers and prepare them for what they're going into. So educator prep programs have to prepare teachers for the one teacher, one classroom model. Assumption number three, new teachers largely are placed on their own and expected to do the same work as veteran teachers. Now, there, you might be thinking, well, I work or have worked in a school that has a mentoring program, and, and that's amazing, but there certainly is uh, no, um, it, it, it's not common for um, new teachers to come into a brand new, their first year of teaching and get regular ongoing support from master teachers. And assumption number four, Students do not regularly have access to the adults that they need. Now, this, means, this statement means different things to different people. For some people, you're saying, you're thinking, yeah, we don't have enough social workers, we don't have enough school psychologists, my school doesn't have a school nurse. Um, and, and that's true, in other schools and other districts, that's not the case, but even if you were to think about an ideal school that does have enough school support personnel, I would argue that most students still do not have access to the adults that they need when they need them. We expect teachers to do the impossible. And that, amazingly enough, is not reflected in teacher attrition data. So I wanna be very clear because I, I hear 
about every week I hear somebody talk about the mass exodus of teachers in our state, the mass exodus of teachers in our nation, and it just never happened. If we're going to solve the problem, we have to be honest about what the data says. And the data is very clear that teacher attrition, or the numbers of teachers that are leaving the profession, is actually lower now than it was in 2016. That is the, top, the, the green bar. Now, the problem is that the blue bar represents educator prep program completion. And that's where our problem is. So the, there's no one in the pipeline. Or the, let me rephrase, there's not enough people in the pipeline. This data comes from a survey that McKinsey did of college graduates who finished in the top third of their class. 33% of those students said that, that oh, well, only 33% believed that teaching would support a, a career, the career that they wanted, a lifelong career. 17% believed that the job would pay appropriately for the skills that the graduate would bring to the table. And 13% thought good performance as a teacher would be rewarded financially. Uh, I read recruiting studies all the time. It's, a, it's actually a hobby of mine. I'm fascinated by why millennials did not go into education and why Gen Z did not go into, into education. And I'm predicting, along with a lot of other people, that this next generation also, if we don't make some serious changes, to the profession will not choose education as their career. People want opportunities for ongoing PD. They want, th these are what young people think about when they think about their ideal job. They want to be paid more for doing better work. They want to have the opportunity to be promoted. And they want mentorship. So <clears throat> traditionally, we've always focused on recruitment retention, recruitment retention. The problem with doing that is that it's, it's, it's a bifurcated system. You've got the universities who are supposed to be working on the recruitment. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, retention is the state's responsibility. But it also goes down to the, we, we know the pull that an awesome principal can have to keep teachers even in difficult to staff schools. So we've got all this, these different buckets working on recruitment intention, and yet enrollment in teacher prep programs has dropped 24%. And so what, what I'm standing before you arguing today is that after decades of education reform, we have not changed much about the system, and we haven't changed the model of one teacher, one classroom. And so I and others have, have been saying for a very long time and I know there's lots of you in, in this room who would agree, that we need a reset. The profession needs to evolve. You saw some of that in the, in the video that, that we just saw. Um, we need a reset that is not just about ensuring that this generation will choose to become teachers, but also that better serves our students. And when we look at the job of teaching, it's, it's a people-focused job. Education is a, a, a people-first endeavor. 82% of funding goes to personnel. And so we have to start with the people when we think about the changes that we need to make. So what can we do? What, what, are, what are some steps that we can take? Well, we've already started. We've, we, we've started with the advanced teaching roles 
program that Best and C and others have championed. And there are 24 ATR districts around the state. Before now, districts were having to find their own funds to participate in advanced teaching roles, um, which if you're not familiar with ATR, it's the idea that a, a, a more um, senior teacher who has proven um, their effectiveness in the classroom, met, it, it maybe teaches half the day and mentors beginning teachers the other half of the day. Um, but what's really exciting is that this year, the General Assembly allocated almost $11 million to ATR for the first time, which will allow us to grow this, pro pro this, this program across the state. And that's great, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we need to do. So using the lessons that we've learned from the ATR program, we want to pilot license, licensure and compensation reform with a coalition of the willing, so vol with volunteer districts, that will lead to what we're talking about. And so you've probably heard about Pathways to Excellence. And um, really what you need to take away from this graphic is, that, is the idea that we tie pay, teacher pay, to license level, and that we create a series of license levels that will, first of all, support beginning teachers in their first few years in the classroom. Um, we should not expect a first and second year teacher to do the same work. You, you know what? You know what often happens to first year teachers? They end up having to do the work that the more senior teachers don't want to do. So they are often given even more responsibility because they are new. And so this creates an apprenticeship, which would um, be someone with an associate degree. So if you have an associate's degree, you can um, be working towards your licensure, but you can be a salaried employee. You can um, have a, a type of license where you just have a bachelor's degree. You, haven't, you've, you have not been through uh, an EPP yet. And, and by the way, our data shows that teachers who are traditionally prepared that their students have better outcomes than teachers who are not traditionally prepared or who are not fully licensed, um, and so on and so forth. And then we, it culminates in a license for with a base salary range of $56,000 to $71,000 with a myriad of different kinds of support that this teacher would provide both at either the school level or the district level. And so this, this ladder, if you will, will allow for teachers to be supported, stay in the profession because they can be promoted, not have to leave to go into administration if they don't want to. And, um, and then at the same time, our students benefit from having teachers who are being mentored. So, I want to take this one more step. Once this is in place, in other words, once we have this, this pay structure that the video referenced, a new pay structure in place that allows teachers to show their effectiveness in a multitude of ways in order to have a higher license level that comes with more pay, then we get to the work of thinking about how we serve students on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've taken care of giving beginning teachers support, and we've created a pathway to advancement for teachers. How do we then rethink what 
collective efficacy looks like when we are trying to educate children. So here is kind of what your typical seventh grade team looks like in a middle school. You've got a veteran teacher with 18 years experience. You've got a lateral entry te teacher who is retired military um, with, with five years experience. You've got a beginning teacher from, from a, that should say nearby, not nearly, univer university who is traditionally prepared. And then you have a long-term sub who is a retired teacher. And then you have your special ed teacher who, who's likely pulling kids out. Now, they may or may not be a fully functioning PLC, professional learning community. Um, may, maybe, maybe they are a professional, a great, maybe they have a great professional learning community and they're meeting weekly and they're, they're talking about how they can best serve their students. But what if we changed that approach and thought about teachers as being a part of a team? And I don't mean team teaching like where you have a couple of teachers in a classroom together, uh, you know, one doing social studies, one doing language arts and kind of fusing, although that's great. But I'm talking about delineating the roles that right now are sometimes unevenly or even unfairly distributed in a building. And you pair this with the pathways graphic of the career ladder. Um, we cannot continue to expect teachers to take on more and more and more of all of the challenges that our students face and expect them to want to be a part of this profession. And when you talk to kids, I, whenever I'm with teenagers, I always ask them, do you want to be a teacher? <laughs> Most of the time, they, they look at me like I have two heads. And when I ask them why not, they say, because teachers, because teachers have to deal with them. They know. They know what they do. They know what they do. And so it goes back to that idea that they are not getting their needs met while they are at school because we are asking teachers to do the impossible. So ultimately, we want to distribute leadership and teacher expertise. And I have no doubt that we can do this. And I look forward to having future conversations with um, all of the thought leaders who are in this space. Um, and you're going to hear from some of them today. And if you're, more, if you're interested in this idea of strategic staffing, Arizona State University is really leading the way with this work. And um, I encourage you to Google Carol Basile, B-A-S-I-L-E, if you want to learn more. So thank you for your time.